Okay, so, so um, I've been in, in this business for a long, long time. Um, the 40 years coding is approaching 45. I'm about to bump all these by like five years. Um, you know, building compilers, that first compiler like when I was 15. Um, it was that Pascal Pico, where, where, did, where did Mario go? That was fun. Um, and, and then distributed computation from before it was even people heard of. Uh, and then all kinds of fun stuff after that. Okay, so, so the, some history of soft, uh, Hotspot, I hope I don't conflict too hard with Mario here. Um, I showed up uh, when Hotspot was just coming off being a self VM. Um, people were converting it to Java. It hadn't yet been made multi-threaded. It had a very simple, what I would call a template style JIT, read a bytecode, slap some code out, read a bytecode, slap some code out. It was single threaded. It didn't support multi-threading. It was x86 only. It was a very simple GC and so on. So uh, I worked at Sun for upwards of seven years. I went to Azul Systems and worked in 010 on Hotspot. Um, I did all kinds of cool stuff of which much is uh, uh, hidden behind the paywall of Azul. It's very sad. Um, but I watched Hotspot do all kinds of fun stuff over the years, including become thread robust, handle you know, one thread, okay, now handle two, okay, now handle a thousand. How about a hundred thousand? So we, we went that way. Um, a lot of ports. I personally implemented or was directly involved in all the ports except MIPS here. Um, and I know there are other ports uh, uh, outside of them. Um, I did a C2, of course, which is sort of the, the, the thing that got me famous in this industry. Um, but then there were lots of other fun stuff, including tons of GCs. Anyone remember the train GC? I watched it come, live, die, you know, went through its entire life cycle. Par Parallel was a default collector for like more than a decade. Um, a bunch of other stuff, including you know, thin locks, bacon bits, Java memory model. That suddenly made concurrent programming safe for the masses, as safe as you could get in that era. Um, hopefully there's a better answer someday. And, and tons and tons of other cool stuff. So the nature of this talk is it was a lot of hard experience. It was learned building Hotspot. So there was a thousand man hours probably uh, building Hotspot. And uh, a lot of that was just hard learning. You just didn't know. So you did something. You took your best guess. You went forward. Sometimes you worked and sometimes you got shot down and you tried again. And you shot, got died and went again. Um, but there are a lot of fun things that you tried hard for the ultimate and speed or footprint or power that interacted in funny, bad, non-obvious ways that weren't, you just didn't know ahead of time that trying to get the next little ounce of performance out had this horrible interaction with code cache lifetimes and GC and whatever else that you had to go back and re-engineer and rethink or suffer through all kinds of uh, nasty complexity and things. So I'm going to whip through, except that because this is an hour and a half slot on a 45 minute talk that I usually talk fast on, there's actually time for going a little slower. So ask me if you have questions, because I'm happy to answer on the fly. Um, and, and if you don't understand something, probably somebody else doesn't either. So I'm going to whip through some choices that we had to make when we were doing Hotspot. Um, and these were choices that were sort of known at the time that this was an interesting choice to go do because VMs were floating around. So, so VMs are these you know, giant complex beasties with 1,000 man hours or man years, sorry, or really, really small. And there's some other really small ones floating around now. Um, it kind of depends on your feature set. Uh, and many of the features interact in bad ways where the interactions were just not obvious up front. So I went the big desktop server route, but the cell phone guys have a different set of choices to make. And because of that, they can get a much simpler VM that's actually reasonably performant, but they give up on a few properties that were key to the server guys. Um, and, and of course, I, I assume most of this applies to .NET and JavaScript as well. So you know, one of the first obvious choices is just how portable do you want to be? Uh, back when I started, obviously I was working for Sun, so you had to do Spark, right? And, and x86, because we came from x86. And one of them is like big Indian, one's little Indian. And they had different calling conventions on different directions the stack screw and all kinds of weird ass things that made portability a pain in the butt. And then, you know, these days, x86, <laughs> right? Okay, maybe, maybe if you're doing cell phones, you're curious about like ARM. Um, but otherwise, nah, x86 can be done. So, so you care, you know, one of these, but maybe not all the rest. Um, I have talked to people trying to do GPUs with Java. It's kind of an interesting one. And then your footprint kind of makes a difference too. Um, I bumped these numbers recently, but if you went back to when I did this talk 10 years ago, you know, embedded was a lot smaller and desktops were, you know, in the, in the couple gigabyte range for which 32 at JVM has made a lot of sense. Now I can't get a desktop of less than 32, so I need a 64-bit JVM all the time, right? Another big choice is whether I should do an interpreter or not. If I don't do an interpreter, I want a stage zero template JIT. But an interpreter is a viable alternative. I can argue strongly both ways. Um, well, how are you going to do multi-threading? Cooperative or preemption? If you do preemption, 
which the servers want to do. You have issues with high thread count, of which not all threads are at GC safe points, and therefore it's a long lag time to get a GC cycle, and that turns into latency on your server app when you have 100,000 runnables and, and you know, 999,000 were not at a safe point and you have to roll them all forward. So there's a bunch of issues there on how to do that one. And then multi-CPU or not, if I'm on my cell phone, I'm probably not actually multi-core. I'm probably running single core, and that means I don't need, for instance, atomic operations, hardware atomic operations, because I don't have another CPU I'm competing for memory with. Okay, interpreter choices. So the easiest possible interpreter is to whip out one you write in like C code or Java, right? But if I grab GCC label vars, which is a non-C extension, I get about double the speed. If I go to a pure assembly, I can double my speed again. I can do fancier inline and dispatch rules. I've seen a couple different ways to slice and dice this. But most of your time running the interpreter is in scheduling the, is the dispatch logic. So you do want to screw around here a bunch. I have seen people do various kinds of hardware support for interpreters. Those all died to death now. Um, you just want to pay attention to how you do it if you're going to do an interpreter at all. If you do do an interpreter, you end up with this funny game where you have the interpreter's layout for stack frames that you're executing, which turns out to be generally really suck for JITs. And so you have a hard problem that your JITs have to intercall with your interpreter. Then I have a bunch of choices that I'm going to make on JITs. Um, if I give up having a JIT at all, then I give up peak performance. And actually, the, the simplest possible template style JIT is generally like double your best interpreter. And then the stage one JIT, what I'll call what, you know, C1, light optimizations, maybe a linear scan allocator, can generally double again. And then the heavyweight, all the optimizations, what C2 turn into, um, is about half again on a risk and about 30% again on an x86. It was enough faster that people cared. And then, you know, in the beginning, I did Spark and x86 plus, 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 plus. These days, I would just go x86, obviously, unless somebody would demand an ARM. And if I'm doing x86 and ARM, you have a bunch of choices to make. Um, th there's, there's evil problems there. So I may, uh, one of the questions I have, if I'm on a cell phone, I might want to interact, intercall directly with native code. If I intercall directly with native code, then a function call to native code for like bitblit on my cell phone for flash games, whatever is like one function, you know, one cycle. So it's like the standard easy thing. Um, but that means that I've just defined what my calling convention for my JIT is. And if you look at C calling conventions, they usually have to support var args, which usually means that you have floats in the int registers. And that's kind of a stupid calling convention in Java where you have strong types and you know what the hell things are. You'd rather pass floats in the float register. So there's an interesting overhead for living with the C ABI that you don't have to if you're in the land of Java or any other strongly typed language where you know the types of the, of the signatures. So do you want to directly intercall with native or not? How often do you go back and forth between native code and your JITed code? What's the frequency? Because in one case, you can make that JIT call very easy at the expense of screwing around and you're passing around mixed argument types. In the other direction, you could have you know, the Java to Java call if you're really cheap when passing around mixed argument types. But calls in a native code have to do an argument shuffle. So that's an interesting trade-off. Um, am I calling jitted code with the interpreter? Generally, interpreter is going to have some sort of stack layout that's variable size stack frames because it's doing a stack model for most of these interpreters. And my JIT wants fixed size frames that are defined by the compiler where he looks at how big the code is for the you know, inlining and everything else is done. He's got a fixed size frame. Those don't intercall nicely. And so I have to, again, screw around to make the intercalls between the jitted and interpreted code. On the other hand, if I don't have an interpreter, I'll get to that slide in a minute. So you get big calling convention screw-ups you have to choose. And then there's this whole inlining non-final methods I'll talk about more, but you want to do inlining. Turns out you want to do inline non-finals. Turns out if you want to do that and you eventually load code, you have to do the DOP thing that Mario talked about. Um, there's a couple different techniques for doing it, but if you, uh, the higher, there's a higher performance technique that only Hotspot does as far as I know um, that's actually worth it. I mean, I'm kind of surprised that people don't do it. And everyone else I see pays the, what I'm going to call the no, hoist, no hoisting cost. Um, but that turns into how the hell you do deopt, which interacts badly with both jetting and interpreters. Um, so on the, you know, stage zero jet versus no interpreter, um, a stage zero jet is just template generation. So you get rid of the dispatch logic, which is what the interpreter pays the most cost for. Um, in exchange for, uh, uh, you know, you get fast, low-quality code and, and, and no funny stack layouts. So you don't have an interpreter's variable-sized frames. 
you have fixed size frames because you have jitted code all the way. So easier calling conventions. It's much simpler engineering. Uh, the downside is that it's still slower than interpreting just run once code. And any, you know, any kind of Java virtual uh, Java program, there's a lot of run once code. And that's your startup time. Um, I know for, for like web pages, they, people you know, running JavaScript have this problem in spades that people bounce from web page to web page to web page to web page, and there's a ton of JavaScript that is run once code. And at that point, you really want to have an, an, a technique which is optimized for I'm never going to see this again, right? Um, so you can ameliorate this somewhat by generating it fast. It's cheap to generate, so it's cheap to throw away and regenerate. So you can get rid of the big footprint issue by just writing it, running it, throwing it away, but that's still more expensive than running an interpreter. You know, the cost to fault it from the decache where you wrote it into the iCache to execute it exceeds uh, what it takes to have an interpreter spin hot in the iCache, even paying the dispatch logic overhead. So GC choices. So in the beginning, when you're trying to get a VM up, you just do something simple. Stop the world, collect it all. Plenty of bugs will come out of that. And GC bugs are notoriously bad for you know, debugging. And so be prepared to build a lot of logic to try to help you diagnose GC crashes. Because uh, a pointer will get missed or flipped or, or not touched you know, at some point, And the crash won't happen to you. Try to use that pointer far, far later, many GC cycles down the road. So get your GC working before you try to go fancy. But then you might want fast. And does fast mean high throughput? That was the default collector in hotspots, the parallel. Uh, parallel old gen, later parallel young gen as well. So fast throughput, but not really low pause. Stop the world, collect everything in parallel, and then start again. And so pause times would vary from, you know, eh, young gen collections are typically uh, high microseconds, low milliseconds. Old gen collections, depending on your size of heap, would run from, you know, fractions of a second to tens of seconds for big heaps, uh, including a few minutes. If you had a, you know, 200 gig JVM, you could get big ones. Um, Another one is to be exact or conservative um, or some combination of the two. Exact allows you to move objects. Moving an object lets you compact the heap. Compacting the heap, defragmenting, turns out to have an interesting performance impact because over the course of a Java program, you make lots and lots and lots of objects, but the general, uh, generational assumption works. Most of them die, like 9% of them die. So you have a live object here, and then 90% dead objects, and a live object, and 90% dead, and a live object. And they're smeared throughout the heap, not making very good use of your cache at all. Once you do that allocation, all the live objects are going to live a long time, get crunched up together, and they live in a much smaller heap footprint, and you get better cache layout. And that turns into higher cache hit rates, and it turns into a measurable amount of performance. So bump pointer, I'm sorry, exact collectors with compaction have an interesting performance gain to offset the fact that you have to take GC cycles. Whereas a conservative collector um, is vastly simple to implement because you don't have to know exactly where all pointers are and correctly flip them. Instead, you can just be approximate. And in a land of 64-bit pointers and 64-bit integers, um, it actually uh, uh, nearly all, it's easy to arrange that nearly all pointers never look like an integer that you're ever messing around with. You just make sure the pointers all have like certain higher order bits set somewhere, and they don't look like any integer. So the false hit rate is extremely low, and so like the drag time for junk objects that you thought were objects but weren't sure, it doesn't actually impact very much. Um, the downside, of course, is you don't compact, so you pay a performance cost for having objects that smeared around the heap constantly. Um, and then, of course, you want parallel, because if you have parallel threads producing garbage and a single thread collecting it, then the single guy, as you get more and more cores, becomes a higher and higher percentage of your total runtime where your single thread only one guy is trying to collect like this vast heap. So you want a parallel collector. And then, you know, these days, maybe you want concurrent as well, and maybe you want them both at the same time, and that becomes a really hard problem. Um, and I can talk about that. It was one of the things that the Zool systems did really well was that parallel uh, concurrent background, you know, collection game. Um, the technique Azul Systems used uh, was to switch the very common mode of using a uh, snapshot at the beginning with um, you know, write barriers to having a read barrier. And the read barrier cost you something on performance, and in exchange got you a much better GC algorithm with much, much lower pause times. Um, so it's, it's an interesting choice to look at. GC choices again, safe points. This is one of the things where Hotspot made a guess kind of fumbled around a little bit and eventually got it right, um, but didn't necessarily get it right in the first go around. 
So uh, a safe point is a place where you can stop and find out your pointers. There's another, uh, another place in the code which is a deopt point where you can stop and have a mapping back to the architected machine state and so you can convert code to an interpreted frames. Hotspot colludes this too. I think that's a, it turns out I think that's a reasonable assumption to make, but they don't have to be colluded. They don't have to be mixed together. Um, but in a stop anywhere VM, you have to find the pointers at each program counter. If you're stopping at any point, some other thread tries to do an allocation fails. This thread's running in some random crap code. You have to stop him and do a GC cycle and move his pointers around and then start him up again. Okay, where are his pointers? He's in some random pile of jitted code. You have no idea where those pointers are unless you have some sort of mapping, mapping uh, uh, you know, machine registers to pointers, which is very bulky. You have it for every possible program counter. Or maybe you have it nearby and you're going to interpret instructions. Say, here's a map that's nearby. I'm going to step the code forward abstractly without executing it. So I come up to the point I'm at, and that's now I know where the pointers are. Another version of that is start from here, step this guy forward, actually executing the instructions until I hit a safe point and stop him there. And a bunch of different techniques people screwed around with um, to go find where the pointers are. This is one that I never tried. I would love to have, and that's just to say split the register uh, set in half and the memory set in half, and put the pointers in the even registers and the even stack slots and the you know, non-pointers and the odds, or whatever, however you want to split it. Um, Hotspot instead said I have safe points. And safe points are spots where I'm going to stop the program counter, where I have a mapping to where all the pointers are. And then how do I stop it? Um, eventually, at the beginning version of Hotspot was we stopped you at a random spot, we injected breakpoints and then in the method in question, and then we restarted that, uh, restarted that core that thread, and it ran until it hit a breakpoint, which was at a safe point, and now we could do a GC cycle on it. And that meant to stop a thread at a safe point, it was first stopped at some random place because the OS happened to preempt it there, and then you patched the code, uh, code cache, and then you flushed the iCache so the guy would see the breakpoint instructions, then you told the OS to restart this thread, and he ran not very long, and he would stop at a breakpoint, and you'd have to unpatch the code, and you were in and out of the OS five or six times for all of this. And so the overhead of getting a thread to a safe point was actually pretty high. And if you had a few thousand threads running, which you know, was the model of web servers for quite a while, um, that would be an interesting long amount of time for just getting the thread stopped. You could begin a GC cycle. Um, cooperative says, I'm going to pull. I'm going to pull in software. I'm going to inject code in the jitted code, every anomaly that says, <coughs> Am I requested to stop for a GC cycle? And I have a, you know, I have a map here. I have, this is my safe point. So it's load a bit and thread local storage, test if it's zero, jump if it's not, it's perfect for an x86. The load is gonna, gonna you know, be speculative, maybe, but it's almost surely gonna hit and cache anyhow. That branch is gonna be predicted correctly. You're never taking it, so it's just gonna fall through. It's super fast to pull. So just freaking emit the pulling costs and skip the whole preempt and roll forward game. Multi-threading issues. So Hotspot started out single-threaded. As soon as you go multi-threaded, you don't have atomic operations for free. You have to know where your atomic operations are because you have to put some sort of locking around it. You didn't need locking before, now you do. So you had to find those the hard way in Hotspot and there was lots of you know, low, late, uh, low frequency bugs that took forever to knock out. But we had unexpected uh, multi-threading issues. Right, so it wasn't engineered that way from the start. Um, and it got complicated and big before people realized it needed to do multi-threading and then pretty horrible games going on there. Um, one of the things that uh, ended up happening is we did uh, lock ranking. You can go look up papers on what lock ranking is. But Hotspot has internal to it something like 50 uh, key internal VM locks. Um, and it's really easy to deadlock yourself uh, without lock ranking. So it's a very aggressive asserts put in to manage the lock rankings to assure no deadlocks in that sense. The other issue was a surprise to me, and this was a decade ago, so now I don't know if this is true anymore, um, but the issue was a low frequency enough that, that I wouldn't risk it anymore. Um, garbage collection requires a stack point of program counter for stack rates. And you know, obviously you do is you go ask the OS, I'm, I'm a GC thread on this core, what is the stack pointer and program counter of that thread over there? Well, the answer is the OS lies <laughs> with low frequency. It still lies. Okay, thank you very much. So, so that, that's the answer, don't bother. Um, we did the obvious OS call and said, give me that guy's you know, register set. Well, every now and then, 
his register set would come back with a program counter or a stack pointer that was off by some, sometimes wildly off, and you could just like filter and say, I got crap back from the OS. I'll restart that thread and then stop them again and ask again, see if I get a better answer. Like, I don't like this answer next time around. But that wasn't good enough. Still, every now and then, we'd come back an answer that would pass all our filters on like, this is a crap value, and it was still wrong. And then you'd crash and burn it back. So, um, and, and in particular, um, I got called up to, to find one of these bugs uh, once during testing and eventually, you know, nailed down what I thought was the right answer. And again, I got called up six months later because Deutsche Bank had their main Java servers crash on a main trading day and they got to lose, you know, however many hundred million dollars you lose when your servers go down on a trading day. Um, and so Sun got told that they'll never again get a contract from Deutsche Bank unless this got root caused. And so I had to go do it again on a core dump that was, you know, like miserable as all hell. It took me weeks on end. So, so a lot of this was like painful learning. Don't trust the OS. Just give it up. Um, and then I have an answer for this. Well, I'll show you in a minute. So why? I don't know. It's my guess. Something like this goes on where somebody's got an interrupt happening with their because they're in a stack overflow and then they go to this weird piece of code and they get a TLB handler nesting and they get a page fault nesting. I don't know what the hell. And then you know the OS. Some other thread asks and the OS says, "Well, you know, I got some bits that haven't been filled in yet." Um, because I haven't made it down to the point where I can fill in the stack pointer PC bits, and so here you go, and you get junk bits left over, and you know, whatever, it's crash and burn time. Okay, then you get multi-core, as opposed to multi-thread. So now you need atomic operations, compare and swap, right, or, you know, IBM blue link sort conditional. Um, and you get memory fences, you have to have actual, you know, coherency barriers. You know, you know and x86 is pretty conservative, but it's not 100% TSO, you know, it's, it's got to be, you have to actually have memory fences in the right places. And you get these low frequency data rate spikes that would cause crashes in the VM because you failed to put a memory barrier in. Or you get crashes in your JVM, in your jitted code, because the application dies because you failed to put a memory barrier in the jitted code, right? So, so you have to have, you know, correctness here in both in the VM internally and the jitted code. Then it turns out that you have to have scalable locks. So it's not just sufficient to have correct ones. They actually have to be scalable, and why is that? And that's because people abuse these things and really do expect to have hundreds of thousands of runnable threads piling through a lock and not have starvation, <laughs> right? And, and the failure if you have starvation is your big busy web server gets hung in some sort of weird spin lock loop and never comes out ever again. And so this was common enough that we went back and re-engineered all these locks to be fair under high contention. So the OS did not give you fair locks. You can't go ask the OS for a fair lock. You had to implement them in user space for a fair lock. But it had to be efficient when it was lightly contended, so you had every possible thing for locking. Spinning and retries, you know, fast path, hey, I'm just gonna CAS, I win, I'm done. Oh, I lose, spin a while, try again, spin a while, try again. Oh, I got it this time around, okay, good. Oh, I failed, okay, I'm gonna go to sleep. Oh, I failed and I went to sleep, and I've been counting as I went to sleep, and oh, there's a few thousand guys here. Now I'm flipping to the fair lock mode, where I demand forward progress on who gets it, and I don't let the OS choose which thread to wake up and go on. I'm choosing, because the OS will not be fair, right? And then the last bullet here is the GC can now be in progress when a thread wakes up. And that means the GC's busily scribbling on his stack when the OS woke the thread up and the thread wants to run and use his own stack, and the GC's like, you know, busy doing brain surgery on him. And so you, you have to take some sort of GC lock when you wake up or else you're executing while your pointers are getting changed up from under you. Okay, 64-bit math choices. This is a, just a fun romp down the wrong direction in the world for unexpected reasons. In the beginning, we started out on 32-bit x86 because there was no 64-bit x86. There was no 64-bit Spark either. So we did long math by doing an add and add with carry. It's very standard, it's how you were supposed to do long math. Ah, no problem. And the compiler emitted long math code like this, add, add with carry. And the compiler was smart enough to say, these are two different instructions, there are two different things in the generated code, I optimized them all independently. Um, and then the major uses of long math turns out to be, well, big integer, because of crypto, because web services. And hey, your son doing web services, of course you're doing web services, you got a lot of crypto math. You got like a big integer math. Big integer math is all doing it by playing high and low half of ints, because that's how they're playing the big integer game where you extend the integers out. And so it's always masking high to low halves or shifting left to right, swapping those words around. That optimizes really well as a pair of ints, especially on an x86, which has seven usable registers. 
seven usable 32-bit registers. So when we went to the 64-bit version for the Spark 64-bit LAN, we mimicked 64 bits on an x86 by having pairs of registers. Well, on seven 32-bit registers, you have three pairs of 64-bit, and your register allocation just like sucks really badly. So you didn't get better code until you had the 64-bit x86 show up. Eh, so you ever get a chance or you're required to go do a 32-bit JVM with a long package? Do the add, add with carry version. Don't do faking 64-bit registers by doing register pairs. Okay, so I'm at a, I'm at a natural break here before I head to the next section. Does anyone want to add a comment or a question here? Okay, I'm going to round, no, yeah? Um, so you said uh, with a compacting algorithm, garage collector uh, improve uh, locality, so there is better caches in the processor. Yeah. Uh, have you tried to uh, sort like objects uh, by usage so that frequently used objects are at its own place? And, uh, I'm sorry, if I try doing what? Uh, to sort uh, live objects by usage? Um, no, because, okay, y yes and no. So, so the fact that they're live compacted the live objects together. The fact that they're allocated in order uh, in memory is almost surely the allocation order that they came out in in general. There's a few breaks where another thread, you know, you dropped over a, a page boundary and another thread's on using that chunk of memory. But most of the objects are mostly in allocation order, which turns out to be mostly in the pattern of the order which they're being used as well. Just happens to work out that way. I'm building some sort of horrible data structure with nested pieces. A lot of the in-between builders fell out, but the nested pieces of structure happen to be near each other in cache space as well as in time allocation order. And so they are kind of sort of ordered already more than you would expect from like a random distribution. And then after that, you rely on an x86's you know, good cache to pull in the hot stuff and keep it around. Okay, so I'm gonna look at native calls. And this is sort of the difference between cell phones and a big server app. And so if I know, for instance, um, the code I'm about to call that's native code, I know what it does and how it behaves, I can make these assumptions about it that, it that aren't true if I'm just calling out to an unknown piece of native code. So Hotspot had to deal with all kind of libraries that people would load, and God knows what they did. So you had to make these very conservative assumptions. In particular, you didn't know what the hell they were doing with pointers. So you couldn't just let them have a pointer. You had to hide the pointers from them, or they would hang on to them forever and use them later after GC had cycled them or they would uh, you know, block threads in places where you couldn't do garbage collection and stuff like that. So I'll step through what goes on here. So I'm doing this on purpose with Spark to make it like, a little more miserable, but it actually turns out to be very similar to what happens on an x86 anyhow. So while it looks gruesome for being Spark, the x86 version ain't much better. So Spark has a register window, which turned out in practice to be not an issue. Um, you saved and restored it at some point. The R's are in the wrong place. That's actually really common, even on x86. <coughs> You're going to pass them in one register, but the native code wants them in a different one because I'm doing this argument shuffle because Java to Java code wants to have the arguments where I love to have them for Java code, but you know, the native code is C code and wants you know, the floats in the int registers. Like, oh, why the hell is that for? Fine. So I'm going to move some args around, maybe call my native code. I am not pulling arg. I have to shuffle back around, then I return get out. So that's still like, hey, maybe this is it. So that's, you know, on, a, on an x86, that'd be, you know, three or four clocks maybe. But actually, of course, the, the calling conventions are all wrong, so x86 will pass the float in your int registers, um, but Java normally just floats and floats. Hey, great, okay, fine. So I have to shuffle, and that meant I have to take my, my float value, um, uh, store it down, and load it into an int register, because I didn't have an int to float direct register to register pass. And furthermore, uh, on the Spark here, it's a little annoying, because it's misaligned, because I had one register already held for the this pointer. It's not an even pair of registers going out. I have to use two instructions to load it. Um, x86 currently will not have that issue, or that went through a time period when it did. And so the JIT actually supports both flavors. Um, of course, I can't actually give the guy a pointer, including the this pointer, because people would hang on to them for all time, and the garbage collector would move it, and then he'd later reach through this dead pointer and crash and burn and die. And while you could tell the native code people don't do that, they did anyhow. And so you had to be defensive or you just crash all the time. So we had to handleize. And what's a handle? It's a pointer to a pointer. So somewhere in the world I would say, I'm going to hand you the address of a pointer. I'm going to store my pointer in the stack and hand you the address. Except I'm going to pass null as null, so I have to do a null check too. 
And then I'm doing the same thing in reverse, coming back out. The guy's handing me a handle, not a pointer. Has to be handle wise. Maybe he hands me null. If not, then I'm going to fetch through the pointer to a pointer and get the garbage collector pointer out of it and let Java run with the garbage collector pointer. Okay, maybe it's a synchronized native. I have to lock now. I have to do some horrible game where I fetch the lockward header and I set a bit. Eventually there's a compare and swap in there. And I have to see if my compare and swap worked. If not, I have some slow path code I'm not looking at. And then when I come back out, I have to redo my task to unlock because I'm racing with you know, somebody else trying to take that lock and maybe there's somebody who's asleep that I have to go wake up. So you have to pass on the lock and get the cows and the unlock as well. Um, and then we get in the game where the stack point and the PC are not available reliably. And because the native code may be slow. So if I know I'm in you know, an embedded system, I have all my native code in my hand, I know how it behaves, I can know that some of these calls are not slow. <laughs> I'm just going to let them run to complete completion before I do GC cycles, maybe. But here, I don't know what this guy's going to do. And maybe he's going to block for I.O. forever and a day. So this thread's going to go out to lunch for the dawn of time and then come back. Um, which means that I have to crawl a stack. Which means I have to get his stack corner and his program counter in a reliable way. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to store it in thread level storage here. So I have some, some cheap hack to get at my thread level storage register on Spark. I just burned a register G7. On x86, I did it by aligning my stacks on two main boundaries. And taking the stack pointer and whacking off the, the low order bits, and that gave me the stack at the, you know, at the start of the two-minute boundary, and that page was reserved for thread local storage. So either way, I have some cheap way to get a thread local storage. I jam down the stack pointer and the return PC. And here there is a I'm taking TSO. So, so what happens here is that this value has to be coherently available to a racing GC thread on another core when this store gets made available. These two stores have a happens before relationship between them. And if you fail to get that right, the GC will see this, decide your stack is crawlable, fetch this, and die. So you must have a, a hard store ordering there between those two instructions, which will work on an x86 and not on an Icanium. And not on maybe some versions of MIPS and some versions of ARM are questionable. Um, so what really happens here is you have to think through a lot of subtle issues of ordering of all these kinds of multi-threading things where setting your thread up for being stack crawled is a multi-threading racing thing. You're racing with a GC thread on another core. So, so you have to think through all the racing issues to make that work right. Same problem happens in reverse. I'm unwinding. So this store is essentially a GC unlock. I normally run with my thread GC lock. The GC is not allowed to mess with my stack. Because my stack's a blur, it's like, my core is like busy screwing with it constantly. So at some point I call in the native code down here, here on up is now unlocked. The GC can and will torture it. When I come back in, I want to start scribbling on that stack as fast as I can. I have to raise the GC, I have to take a lock from him. So I have a chaos instruction to say, give me back my own lock, my own stack, so I can scribble on it again. And again, if you screw this up, You'll start tearing into execution while the GC is like scribbling and you're you know, doing brain surgery on you and you'll die. These are all sort of hard lessons to learn <laughs> in, the, in the land of hotspot where we didn't get it right the first few goes around. Um, odds and ends show up. The JNI and M is really, it's really a service being provided to the native code in the Java land. Uh, other languages probably don't need this or they'll use something different there. Um, temporary handles is another service. It's just a, a stack-oriented methodology for handles that the native code wants to be able to cheaply make, and you're just going to unwind for it on exit. So you take a current stack pointer and you reset your stack pointer on exit, fine. Um, profiling tags is another way to say, um, I'm in native code. What is that native code doing? Well, I don't have a good way to ask the native code for how to profile it unless I have a native code profiler built into my VM. So instead, I'll put a tag down that says, like, I know this is happening doing I.O or networking I.O. versus some other kind, or it's bitlet, it's graphics, or whatever the hell it's going to be. And then the tags can come out later when I'm profiling. Yeah, it was a convenient thing. So then my native call actually looks something like this. Some setup, there's a gen I handleize some arguments, I shuffle pointers around for, for you know, ints versus floats, I might even take a lock variant here, I didn't show it, I do my GC lock, I allow GC, I make my native call finally, and unwinding, I have to take GC lock back, I have to de handleize the return. I just showed none of the slow paths, and I only passed like two arguments the OOP and the, uh, the this pointer and the float. So, so this stuff gets bigger, thicker, longer for more arguments getting passed around. 
Yeah. So about the calling convention, so in TurboFan, we basically just describe the calling convention and the register allocator takes care of all of the loops. So eventually, so, so we started out, so we started out that way, and eventually it was easier to describe the calling convention to a piece of custom code that would generate this as if, like, like, like the compiler would do it. But, it was, but the compiler had too many other issues that he wanted to deal with, and the, the mapping between multiple calling conventions was not sort of interesting in that level. So these in Hotspot are generated by like a signature generator who caches signatures of these kinds of calling conventions and the, the prefix code as they get used, and then you know, injects where he needs to uh, doing a lookup on it. But this is sort of a, the description is, a, I, have a, I have a description of what the calling convention is that is then interpreted to build this. So these are not handled in that sense. So, so the advantage that one can get from using a register allocator is that you may avoid the loops altogether. And, they, and those loops basically become hints. So like I said, we tried that in Hotspot. And, it, and the, the frequency of calling the native code was not great enough to justify the grief in the compiler. The first cut of C2 did exactly that. And then somewhere along the line, we said, no, that's too much trouble. Um, we'll do it this way. And that freed up the register allocator uh, to not have to deal with the, the cross-convention game. It, because, because it really only matters when you're doing this. Now, if you're doing this a lot, and maybe JavaScript does, and Java does not, th then, then, then I could see it makes a difference. Because then you want to inline the rest of this into some larger uh, function body. And as you say, uh, uh, this overhead goes away and becomes just in line with whatever it takes to do a native call. Yeah. Instructions, so we yeah. just use the same mechanism. It, it, it's it, basically a prepass in the register allocator that inserts some various ranges that are just resolved by splitting. Yeah, okay. Like I said, the hotspot did this. I mean, the code to do that is still around. It's just not being used because this was, this was too cheap and easy, and it, like I said, it freed the allocator from having to do a good job there. That said, the allocator in Hotspot clearly has a lot of you know, fixed register games that he understands, both because of calling conventions and because you're x86 and you have fixed registers floating around. Um. Mm. Uh, so I just unwinding a little bit. So you were saying you've got the, the indirect pointers. I think they were the handles. Handles, yeah. So when you call native code, you guarantee that the thing that's pointed to can never be moved. Do you allocate mm -hmm. it in a different part? Or? No. So the hotspot went back and forth on this topic a few different iterations. So the issue there is, is some people wanted to pin. Uh, objects, typically large arrays that you're going to do, uh, you know, OS level games that either networking or bit blip for graphics or shit like that. Um, the pinning of arrays caused all kinds of grief for various kinds of allocators who didn't want to have special case code for not moving objects, like asking the question, is this pin? And if so, don't move it. So uh, the allocator people, the DC people fought back constantly against pinning. It was put in to support uh, this kind of stuff. Then it turned out that that wasn't good enough without handling. So it's the original hotspot, no handles. You got a pointer directly. Then you had to have pinning so that you could know that a GC cycle could run without this guy being crushed. That turned out to be not good enough either because the native code would hold on to the, the, the pointer and use it in a different uh, native call sometime later, right? And then he'd crash and burn because you had actually moved it. So he still needed to be handleized because you didn't know what the native code was going to go do. Now that said, they still wanted pinning, so for the duration of the function call, they could take the pile of bytes, which was like some Java array that you filled with network butts, bits, and you're hanging off the OS, which is like a feed it straight up to the hardware device driver and do a zero copy network, you know, you know, Nile go to town kind of game. Um, that turned out to be too hard for the GC people, that they all hated it. And so uh, eventually pinning both got enabled to work in like the default collector and pushed back from on the other newer collectors really hard. And so instead, you know, Nio went to having native buffers. So, you know, Nio came after unsafe and unsafe lets you have uh, native memory that you could directly talk to from Java code. So the, the new go forward plan as of a decade ago was if you wanted to have pinned memory, you made a native buffer instead. You scribbled into it from Java code directly using unsafe and then it wasn't moving, it wasn't part of the heap, right? And the OS could actually hand you like two meg aligned because I have my stupid network card DSP addressable memory was like here and nowhere else. And, and here you go, Mr. Java code, you can go scribble on it directly. So that was how that path worked out. Thank you. Okay.
So I'm going to change again. So we're, we're, I guess we did that to stop for people questions. So okay, so some things that worked out really well that you know going into it, I had no clue we were going to work out well, and in hindsight, they did. And the safe point notion is one of them, both for DOPS and for GC. I get really good optimization out of the C2 compiler um, by treating the DOP point as a form of a, uh, 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 like a, a function call that took a bunch of arguments in, which happened to be the architect and machine state, um, and then you know, didn't need those bits afterwards, um, except it would return like, the state of memory to prevent memory ops from floating around past the GC point. Um, then you just had to guarantee that every path through a function always had one of these in a bounded period of time. So once per loop iteration and once in every path through. It wasn't too hard to do. It's actually really good optimization. A lot of things that were like dead by the JIT's point of view but needed in an architected machine state, the GC, the, the compiler would know, recognize right away, do a little profiling on lifetimes and say this shit is really junky dead. It's only there for the safe point. So I'm going to spill it to stack right away and then free up my registers. And so he would generate the value and spill it and forget about it, you know, in terms of what it would do to your code quality. And that worked out really well. So, so you would get, mostly get really good optimized code. There's some games had to be done for loops I can mention here. Um, uh, threads would all stop at these safe points. And then you get the thread to do a whole lot of self-service tasks when he stops at a safe point because um, he can crawl his own stack and know reliably where things are. And so in particular, his own stack is hot in his own CPU. And so when you stop a thread uh, uh, you know, at, at a safe point, um, we would put down a list of, of actions he should go do. And one of them might be, go find your GC roots. And he crawls his own stack. Well, it's all hot in his L1. So it's all, it's all over within microseconds. And he has a list of GC roots that he puts down somewhere for a background you know, GC thread to go pick up later and, and do stack crawling with. Um, the software polling turned out to be cheap once you figured it out. You just had to do a load compare branch. It was all going to be hot in cache and predict correctly. It's like a clock cycle or two. And then the next thing I did at Azul Nod at, at uh, Sun was I did this cooperative preemption where the OS would ask a thread to hit a safe point and say, okay, your 10 milliseconds of runtime, so if you have a quantum, time quantum, it's 10 milliseconds. It's about up. Come to a safe point. If you don't come to a safe point shortly, I'm going to stop you the hard way. But if you're a good guy and come to a safe point early, you just do a thread.yield you know, an OS yield call, and I know that you've now stopped and I'll let somebody else run. Well, the impact of that was when I had 100,000 runnables, not 100,000 threads blocked, 100,000 runnables, almost all of them are all out of safe point. So when it comes time to do a GC cycle, I can just sweep through my list of 100,000, discover they're all at a safe point already, do my thing on their stacks, right? It's all good. So, so the trick there was that let us have very low pause times because you didn't have the issue of having threads, 100,000 threads, you stopped them at random places, you had to roll them all forward to safe points, that didn't happen. They're all already at safe point. So it's really, really convenient. You gotta push my uh, so there were a couple papers about being able to GC precisely and in the instruction by doing direct values and stuff like that. Right, yep. Did you pursue that? Did you find out about how much metadata that takes? So, so we looked at a lot of those things in the early years of Hotspot and came up with safe points as a, a fine alternative. After the optimizer gets done, safe points show up every thousand, a few thousand instructions, which on an x86 runs out to, you know, in some modest nanosecond count, it's all fine. Um, and then the rate of which they showed up wasn't big enough to care anymore. So I didn't need to have safe point information at every clock cycle. It wasn't, it wasn't enough an issue to have a guy roll forward to a safe point um, as, a, as a time to a GC cycle. So Azul Systems, you know, the current state of the art in, in low pause times, uh, pauses from all sources, uh, max pause times will be in the modest, you know, low microsecond count range for all sources, including full GC cycles. And so, you know, the answer is polling works. It's good enough. You could pay a few nanos, take it to a safe point from when you first set the bit, and then that's it. He's at a safe point, and you can do your thing on him. You have other, other bigger fish to fry than rolling a thread forward to a safe point. In particular, if a GC has to crawl your stack, that's way the hell slower than you crawling your own stack. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, safe points. The, other, the only other game played with safe points is that in hot loops, um, small, dense, basically high-performance code, HPC, Fortran-style code, you do want to play more games because even the single safe point per iteration, which is just holding on to the array bounds, has to still bump like the index counter for the loop is more than you want to pay. 
And so uh, if you unroll the loop and you still have a safe point in it, you cut down the cost of the safe point by the unroll factor, and maybe that's still too much. And so ultimately, we went to unroll and jam, uh, which is a you know, compiler optimization that would let you multiply or divide the cost of safe point by n, where n was some compiler knob you could turn on for the number of times you tripped the inner, innermost loop. But you can drive the cost of safe point down as low as you wanted, as long as you're willing to take however many nanoseconds to, uh, to run to that safe point. And that was just a knob you wanted to get people to turn. Okay. Um, this is a thing that I basically got known for because it was the thing that everyone said you couldn't do. Um, it, I got told by, over and over again by senior people in the field left and right, you cannot put a heavyweight compiler in a jitting system. It's just too expensive for the compile pauses. And the answer was, you can. And it kept getting better and better performance until it's very clearly now that Java is on par with C code. There are times when either will beat the other. I can pull out obvious examples where they both go either way, but it's on par with C code. Um, and, and the surprise to everyone was just how heavyweight you're allowed to get and any kind of a program has any kind of run length. So JavaScript has an issue for startup time for web pages, but things that are more like server apps or have run times, you know, you know, moment, to moment run times on the order of minutes to hours, uh, you don't care anymore what the compile time costs are. So in particular, my IntelliJ IDE comes up and it has a few seconds of runtime to get warmed up and then it's responsive to my edit keys because the compilers are all done. And it looks like, a, you know, Java code that's running like fast and, and easy, but it, the secret is it just had a, it just needed a minute to warm up. I did a lot of optimizations that were heavyweight and paid off, and these are actually pretty cheap to do. They look like they're heavyweight. So I took a loop that had like array references, and, and I would add a pre and a post loop to do the range check on the iterations I didn't know whether you're going to trip a range check, and then in the body I knew there were no range checks so I could remove them. And I did at least one initial iterations so all the one-shot tests like null pointers got done, and then there were null pointer tests, no null pointer tests in the inner loop. And then you started unrolling that inner loop and putting the odd counts of the unroll in the pre or the post, whichever was convenient. And so this guy didn't test except I went from one to, in, you know, in mod four, whatever the hell it was going to be. Um, it was all outside the loop. And at this point, it starts to look like what a C compiler or a Fortran compiler would admit. And now I can do all kinds of, you know, shuffling of loads and stores and interleave them for hardware scheduling to do the right things. And I can insert prefetches if I didn't have an x86 auto prefetching, whatever. I can do all kinds of fun stuff um, that turned out to make it performant. Um, and the other one is they did a, a, a graph-based IR, and that was the very fast and very lightweight new optimizer. And it turned out to be very easy to extend, but at that time it was very non-traditional. These days a lot more people use the sea of nodes IR. Um, I see it show up in all kinds of uh, uh, compiler technologies, but back then it was like unheard of. It, you know, it's SSA all the way beginning to end. There is no other IR except SSA, and you take the obvious sort of steps to optimizing SSA down to the minimalist set and suddenly you have a graph-based IR and that graph-based IR is very fast to do optimizations on and very easy to think about doing optimizations on and it turns out to be very easy to extend and debug and develop and blah, 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 blah. And they made a great, uh, a great counterpoint to having, you know, how, how expensive is it? So C2 as a compiler, as an optimizing compiler, so I, I call it roughly on par with like GCC-02, just a second. Um, in terms of the code quality, but the time it takes to get there is so much faster than a traditional compiler. It's, it's way slower than C1, and it's way the hell faster than anything else that, that came before it. Yeah? Okay, back to loop optimizations. What about software pipelining and loop pipelining? Does it make sense or theoretical? So we looked hard at software pipelining, and on x86 it doesn't make any difference. Okay. You don't care on x86, right? x86 is like, you know, horseshoes and hand grenades and nuclear bombs. Close is close enough. Um, it only mattered on hardcore risk chips like, you know, Spark in the beginning and later Itanium. Um, everyone else learned to do out of order good enough that you would just do standard list scheduler in a basic block. And if you had enough instructions, you just do a list scheduler and you would do a good job. That was it, right? So the typical basic block length in a random junky Java code is five instructions, one of which is a branch one of which is a hidden internal branch that prevents me from scheduling these any other way, but it's usually a null pointer check being on for load instruction, but it's effectively five instructions. In a loop, after I've unrolled it, it's hundreds. But you don't do thousands, because you blow out your iCache, so you have a little knob you turn, how much you want to unroll, but you unroll enough to get hundreds. And now list scheduling just like, does a 99% optimal job and you're just done. 
Okay, the other one I did was the graph coloring allocator, and I would do this again. Um, the trick is that you have to be robust in the face of over inlining, because inlining is the number one optimization, as found out by people before. It remains the number one optimization. You must inline. Now you have to have inline heuristics. How much inlining you want to do? More, less, whatever. Well, if you do too many, you have too many live values. And now your register allocator has to spill. Okay, so how good is your register allocator in spilling? Well, you got an x86. Now it's 15 registers up from seven. You're still going to spill, right? You're not arm. Maybe you have 31, 32. You're still going to spill. Okay, how good are you at spilling? Well, a traditional sort of allocators of, of years past, the answer was one good spill deserves another. And once you start spilling, you spill a lot. And then you spilled more than the cost of doing a prologue and epilogue code for not inlining. And you would rather have not inline. So these guys all walk this edge where they crank up inlining, crank up inlining, and every time they crank it up, they get more and more performance until suddenly the allocator like fails. And then they suck. And so they have this knife edge where they don't want to fall off. So they back away from that edge in order to not fall off it too often. And what I did with C2 and the graph coding allocator is I could push hard into that edge. And if I fell off, it was a smooth slope. It wasn't a knife edge. I would just start spilling to match the cost of not inlining. And that meant I didn't have to, I could run tighter to the edge, and that turned into more performance. An interesting amount more performance. This, this is where my go-to spot for junky random Java code performance was for many years. I would go hack the allocator some more, and then I could push inlining harder. So I never really understood how you tune heuristics to basically get the locality. So the more you inline, the bigger your interference graphs get, right? So yeah. is there a heuristic that is based on distance between uses that somehow you want to I look at those uh, cliques and groups. So, okay, so I tried for a couple of years to get a paper on how to do fast graph coloring allocators, including how to build an interference graph the right way, and PLDI always said, oh no, you have to talk about the difference between graph coloring and you know, linear scan. So I have some fun papers I can show you on how to build a, uh, an interference graph the fast way. Um, <laughs> that said, the inlining heuristics were all driven by profile data. So I would inline if the profile said it was big enough, if the code involved was small enough, if I thought it was like an accessor function. There's a couple of rules on inlining that Mario alluded to machine learning could beat eventually. Um, and they're not too hard, and they're 99% they're like, you're tiny and small, I'm going to inline you. You're big, I'm going to look at profile counts. They're really big, I quit, and I say, don't inline. Right? That's the, sort of the, the, the nature of it. Now, having inlined and gone through all the optimizer, the register allocator gets handed a big pile. And he goes through and does like, standard, I took all my profiles and I annotated all the basic blocks with execution frequencies. So now he knows where he wants to spill and where he doesn't because he has cold code and hot code and he's trying to keep the hot code in registers. Uh, and so you first did a you know, standard graph coloring and that would fail. So in x86, I have this fun, that, that same paper has this fun observation. Um, when you first hit the allocator, the maximum concurrently live values is generally in the order of 100 to a couple hundreds. And you have 15 registers, but you have 100 live. So you do one round of spilling. And you don't want to get too aggressive on the spilling because that's the whole point, you're trying to not have too many spills. But you spill in and around all the places where you have hot versus cold and whatever. Uh, and on the second round, you have eight things live on average out of your seven registers because you get really close to the line. And then it turns out you stay at about eight things live because it turns out even though you only have seven registers, you can typically color with eight uh, values. And so you have a little more edge case spilling on a, on a round two or round three and then you're like done and you got it. Um, does that answer your question on how I chose what to inline? So, so, so the inline did not understand, did not understand the register allocator. We did not inline for keeping register counts low. We inline based on performance, call site, and size estimates. So there was a size estimate that said the whole allocation blob was getting too big. It didn't deserve to be one thing. But after that, it was just the allocator went to town on what he was handed. And no more inline decisions could be unwound, if you will. So, so just as kind of a counterpoint to that, I mean, we use linear scan like a lot of people these days. Yeah. And all the action is in splitting heuristics. Like, where do you split? I have a lot of interesting splitting heuristics in there. Yeah. Can, can yeah. The so the, I can talk through the splitting code. It's one of the largest pieces of code in the Hotspot compiler, maybe in the Jagger JVM. Um, I wanted to rewrite it for many years, and I left before I got that chance. Um, it's like a single 5,000 line function. Um, <laughs> ah, and it does a really good job. Never had any bugs? Um, no, the bugs have beaten out long ago. The one thing about Hotspot 
is it's got a lot of users. So in terms of statistical sampling of the bugs, if there was a bug, we, we fell over it. Um, so the, the allocator is correct if complicated. Um, the, the main issue is uh, knowing what the profile counts are in the basic blocks. And first cut is split everywhere I had hard register constraints, split everywhere around uh, big jumps and frequency profiles. So that would bound loops with splits. And then uh, color again. And then unwind uh, overspilling by re-merging live ranges where they would conservatively never increase the colorability of the graph. And that combination basically you know, did the right thing. Spilled around all the hot loops, gave you enough registers to make things go, but didn't typically overspill uh, over anywhere, except occasionally in like off paths where you're going to hit the interpreter anyhow. If I didn't bother doing the cleanup code, I would just let the spills happen horribly and, and not bother. So the generated code was big because I sped out all these spill codes in these off paths, but the actual runtime was fast because you never actually executed that code unless you were dying off through the interpreter anyhow. Portable stack manipulation. Turns out you can do it and it's good. I, I didn't believe you could when I started the game because I was looking at Sparks with register windows and Big Indian and stacks went this way and x86 with little Indian and stacks went that way and Spark had you know the return register and the x86 put the return on the stack and all these things were different. It turns out I need a notion of starting a stack frame, doing a next, knowing you have no more frames. I need a frame iterator. So we got a frame iterator. I, I, I'll have to claim I didn't do it, but after I watched it in action, it worked. It was good. Um, I ended up working on all these different OSs. So, you know, uh, register windows on Spark, you had to flush them because the hardware was holding on to thinking with the GC. And so the GC would write the backing memory and the hardware would flush later and overwrite your GC pointer or vice versa. Right? So you had to watch register windows. Uh, uh, two kinds of stacks on Atanium and Azul, depending on whether it was, you know, register windows or not. Um, oh, there's a bunch of other bits in there for mixing. Uh, it's not, not going for there. The, the, this one, frame adapters, um, was part of the stack call game. A, Originally, we did these adapter frames, and I'll distinguish them from frame adapters, by claiming an adapter frame was a real frame on a stack. It actually bumped your stack pointer and would allow you to change like return registers from a call, and that was grief, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, and, and don't do it. But frame <laughs> adapters were cheap and easy um, uh, as one way to change between interpreted and did it in native code. Uh, but the actual notion of portable stack manipulation it was easy once you figured it out, it wasn't, it was, and it was a good thing to go do. It, it, gave, you, um, it gave you a real uh, 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 abstraction barrier between what you're trying to do with stacks and what the underlying hardware was going to do with the stack. And that was useful. So you had a notion of a language level stack. And then you had a notion of a hardware level stack. And, and that was the divider between what those two were. It was a good idea. Code cache. Um, everybody wants to have all their code in the same 4 gig space so they can use the short PC for everything. And this turns out to be key performance for all the chips I've ever looked at. So put your code in the same 4 gig space so you can have 32 bit PCs. Okay, fine. Even on 64 bit VM. So it's a giant savings versus far calls, um, generate all your code near each other. Pretty easy. Um, blah, 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 lot debugging flags. So um, as Mario pointed out, one of the uh, innovations that came into Hotspot was this notion of a fast, slow path. And then you merged afterwards, right? Well, what it really meant was you had a rare path and a common path. Because if it was all bad every time, you had to do the bad thing every time, you didn't be able to split your paths. But if there was something that was common that you could go cheaper, you made a fast path. Therefore, the slow path was uncommon. Therefore, it's untested. So you had to force the testing on it. And the blah, 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 blah flags would force the testing by making all the slow paths, which are actually rare paths, I don't care about slow, they were rare paths, you make them common. Right? And this wa uh, was one of the big steps Hotspot did to get uh, the next level of, co of quality, of stability out. Up until this point, we kept having crashes that would eventually would turn out to be something off and a very rare slow path that would do something silly that, you know, whatever happened, it didn't work out right, quite right. <laughs> eventually, uh, I think David Unger came out and said, hey, play this game, and, and we played it once, and then we played it a second time, and then something's like, obvious, oh my god, do it everywhere. And so we had dozens and dozens of these flags. You hand it to QA, say, turn this flag on, it's going to run really, really slow. Okay, turn all your timeouts out to the max and let it run for days. Okay, usually you would crash a bug, it comes out really easily. Um, and furthermore, you start annotating the crashes on the slow path sides to say, oh, I just ran through this slow path over here, 
And he did something, and now I'm crashed. And then you could work your way backwards, wasn't too hard, and nail the button. So this was a big jump in stability here. Was it necessary to have a fly per feature? Or could you have had, could you have had like a super thing? Turn all the slow no, it was per feature because it was too slow. Yeah, okay. So you ran out of, of QA time. So you always took this balance between QA time and, and, and you know, testing quality. So Hotspot with um, debug mode turned on, asserts turned on, runs about 4x slower in the VM proper. So the little asserts involved is huge. Um, the JITED code runs fast still, and so it depends on what ratio of time you're spending in the VM versus in the JITED code. And over time, more and more people are spending more time in the JITED code as the VM got more and more stable. But it really was a, an interesting slowdown to turn on debugging mode, and then you'd add these flags and you'd pick up 10x more slowdown you know, for each individual one. So you had, to, you had to play carefully there, but it was totally worth it for stability. Finlocks. Um, you know, Hotspot did Finlocks one way, David Bacon, as Bacon Bits, did a different way, but it's the same idea. You have some sort of object word you're going to cast, uh, word in the header you're going to cast on. Um, so every object has a header, the header had some spare bits, or you're going to make spare bits, damn it, and you would do a cast to own the object, and unlock would cast to unwind. Um, in the original x86s, the unlock sucked because there's always a cache hit to main memory, but these days, the last generation, uh, I think a CAS is now, uh, will hit an L2. Effectively, the cost is an L2 hit. Um, so it's not so bad to unlock. Um, turns out you actually want thinner locks um, because too many locks in Java are in there because the system, because people don't know how to program currently, so they throw in locks until it quits crashing. Because okay, so you get a lot of uncontended locks that are literally never contended. And so you want them to not even CAS, even if it's hot in your L1. Because you can optimize across the locking boundaries. So you want to have these things where you speculatively own a lock. And that works great until some other thread actually does want the lock, and the guy who currently owns it speculatively doesn't know, he's not tracking whether he should have it locked or not. That's the whole point of him not having a CAS or an inlining. He just is kind of loosey-goosey with it and running to town. So you have to tell this guy, to tell that guy, hey, stupid, stop at a safe point, count your real locks, and acquire this lock if you own it or let it go if you don't. Right? And so it's a pain in the butt, but once you get it, there are some interesting performance gains to be had there. And the final bullet is simply a Java memory model. Worked out nicely. It's a one-liner to say millions of programmers now write concurrent thread-safe Java code because of the Java memory model. OK, so here's some hard things that I did that I think worth doing. So the others are things that turned out to be not too hard to do. These are things that were actually hard to do, but definitely worth doing. And being portable was one of them. Um, doing it on uh, you know, Spark versus x86 meant I had Windows or not, RISC versus 6. Sysk, tiny register set versus big, big Indian versus little Indian. I had to have an abstraction layer to keep apart the different pieces of hardware. And that turned out making the system more robust in a general way. Because there's a lot of crappy games going on in the hardware that once you get above a certain level of abstraction, you don't really care about anymore. You just want to know that there is a stack frame and it does something. And I can go next stack frame, please, and give me the start, and give me the end, and give me the program counter and the stack pointer. And I don't need anything else. I don't care if they get registered one or not. I don't care if you're calling this way that way. I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Put an abstraction layer in, get rid of that. Right? So, um, you know, basically separates out our idea from implementation better. It used to be interleaved. These concepts were all interleaved in the code. Um, and breaking them out really forced you to see the abstract reality of what you needed to accomplish and, and hide the, you know, the, the hardware from seeing things, right? from, from messing with your head. And then the middle compilation tier, um, Hotspot needed one for many years. I think it has one now. Um, I did it at Azul Systems. It was another one of these things that was a pain in the butt because you had to have a... Uh, 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 Runtime system had to unify the runtimes because the C1 and C2, for political reasons, didn't have a unified runtime for many years. I think now Hotspot has C2 for both a low and an upper tier. And so it's a cheap version of C2. Deopt. I alluded to this a while ago. If you do it right, there's no runtime cost at all to inlining non finals. And this is actually an interesting performance boost. Um, what most people do is they have a line in the sand where they've claimed they're going to have inlined a non final and they can't move code past it. And if later they need to deop, they put a branch instruction there to say, ooh, from this point forward, I can't execute because the inlining's all wrong. Um, and Hotspot instead did the deop where they rewrite the stack frames and did it the right way, and it was totally worth it. Um, it is kind of tricky to get it right. Um, this is not rocket science, but it's damn bit fiddly code for which those blah, 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 lot debugging flags will save your soul. <laughs> Make sure you get deoped a lot as one of your flags. 
and you'll find all the weird corner cases. And then once you're done with them, there's only so many. There's only many according to the count of different signatures you're calling and kind of registers types you have. Uh, you're done, and it's all correct, and it works forevermore. Self-modifying code. OK, so um, lots and lots of it in Hotspot, um, which I think I have another slide on how to do that one right. So code patching for not entering the inline caches, of course, you have to patch in the face of racing Java threads. Um, and, and, and given machine models, especially x86, you're allowed to see partial patches. No matter what order you patched code in, the x86 would not guarantee you he wouldn't see one versus another. Um, so in particular, if I have a series of instructions, I'm going to patch. If I patch uh, 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 this one and then this one, um, x86 might actually see this one without that one. Um, even though I've patched them in the reverse order and do a memory barrier, that wasn't good enough. You had to actually run this through a safe point if you wanted to guarantee that his iCache didn't have preloaded instructions um, that he was going to see the wrong one and miss the other guy. It was a real pain in the neck. Um, you have variable size instructions. You can't do atomic patches across cache lines. So in particular, I would do no op padding on patchable instructions to guarantee they didn't span a cache line on a piece that I had to do an update on. So I would do a, a call instructions one byte, and I got a four byte address. That four byte address cannot span a cache line, but the one byte and the four byte can totally span a cache line. So I'll pad until there is no cache, uh, there, uh, the, the, there is no cache line in here, and maybe spanning between these two. Um, you usually have to jump and a call and a couple things you had to move around. Um, risks are a lot easier. You just do an iCache shoot down. Um, they typically would guarantee some ordering. It was, it's much easier. Um, oh, that's what I was going to say here. The other thing about inline caches, if people want to play with the game, I sh I'm happy to give people like maybe offline talk through what the subtle things go on there. But there's a bunch of subtle stuff in inline caches that it's easy to make a mistake on and they'll lead to long, low frequency bugs forever in a day until you get it right. Uh, I can step you through what and why. There's a, there's a state machine you have to watch your way through and then one of the edges in the state machine is non-obvious. Um, as a consequence, you ended up with having a lot of assembly code you had to generate. And you know, a lot of handmade assembly code. Um, so you ended up wanting tight integration between the runtime invariance and the, 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 the runtime and the VM invariance with the generated assembly code and the generated jitted code. And an external assembler just wouldn't do this. So instead, we always had a version of an assembler. It was written in C. It was actually C code, but it looked like some kind of high level, I mean, like assembly code. But it read easier than like x86 classic assembly code, like sucks to look at. So it was a reasonable looking, risky like, but x86 assembly code, and when you run this C code, it actually just spits the code out to a buffer. Plus provides invariance, proves that you didn't screw up. And maybe other support, like putting in oop maps in, um, padding no ops around iCaches. There's a, like a dozen things that this guy would do um, to help you write hand-generated code, and you're just gonna have a lot of it. So just be prepared and upfront, get yourself an assembler that you can love and will write codes and bytes into a buffer that you can tell it go to town on. Um, one of the things I did in Azul Systems, I went to a single word header on a 64-bit JVM. That gives you a lot of space savings and objects, which turns out to be speeding your caches. To do that, I couldn't use a 64-bit class pointer. I had to use some sort of dense class ID, um, which wasn't too hard once you knew that and engineered for it up front. And it was, a, it was an interestingly good savings. I needed a thread ID instead of a thread pointer. Uh, thread IDs I got because I aligned myself on two meg boundaries. And if I want a thread ID, I just do it a shift. And the higher order bits after shifting by two megs were your thread ID. Da -da -da. Um, that gave me space to put a hash code in for 32 bits, full size hash code, because I'm now looking at you know 64 bit JVMs with 100 gigabyte heaps, and so not a billion objects, maybe 100 billion objects for which you wanted all 32 bits of hash code, or you're just dying the collision death. Oh, here's a dense thread ID. Um, turns out thread pointers are actually very common in the core VM code and in the little pieces of jitted code or hand generated assembly in and around like fast path locking, slow path GC code, um, the, the dozens and dozens of places that were speed critical. So you had to be able to get that thread pointer very, very fast. And so, you know, stack pointer to GPR, shift right by whatever the count was, you know, 10 or 20 and done. That was, that was the thread pointer grab in, in the Azul VM. Uh, safe pointing single threads done in Azul, not in hotspot. Um, was incredibly useful, and that's because I could stop any individual thread at any time um, by just setting a bit somewhere. And then I could ask him to go do some sort of self-service task, so here's a few of them. <laughs> Clean inline caches, revoke a bias lock, 
install remote exception. So in Java, it's okay for one thread to tell another thread, here, eat a thread.def. Or eat a no pointer exception, even though the JIT has clearly cleaned out all no pointer tests because no pointer is not possible here. But bam, you're no pointer now. So you have to install that exception and make it actually work right. Um, there's lots of these things that you want to play this game with. Um, and then it, it meant that I could do a sort of rolling safe points where individual threads were stopped onesies at a time to get past like a GC safe point, a GC major cycle. And they would each flip a bit saying, ah, I passed through a safe point. Um, I'm done with it. And when all threads had checked in, I can now flip my GC. And the GC's running background. He doesn't care how long it takes. But it didn't stop all the threads. And furthermore, it didn't stop such that the first guy to stop was also stopped waiting for the last guy to stop. So the time for that rolling safe point, the payment cost was an individual thread, took a safe point hit, checked out what he had to do, flipped some bit, and went back into action. It was all over in nanoseconds. OK, some things I won't do again. I'm running out of time, despite the fact I've had more time than possible here. So um, I won't write a VM and C in C++ now, because Java is fast enough. And mixing oops in a garbage collected language, non-garbage collected language is a total pain. Because in particular, in C++, you have this pointer, which happened to be an oop, which you forgot about, so you would pass across a GC allowable call site without realizing you did so, and then your this pointer changes up from under you. So kind of a, kind of a pain in the butt. Um, and lots of roll your own malloc's in Hotspot. Like at one point, it counted like five or six variations on arenas and resource areas and stack areas and crap like that. They're all basically uh, trying to get around the GC issues. Um, C2 does burr style pattern matching, which was useful if you were doing, you know, backs. Well, x86 is close enough to a uh, risk that you don't need it, never needed it for a long time. And it made the JIT engineering that much more pain in the butt. Uh, Passion roll forward save points. I mentioned that. It was hideously complex with multiple OS spin resumes. No, don't bother. Just do software polling. It's good enough. <laughs> Call save registers turned out to be a big mess. Sounds like a good idea. Turns out x86 doesn't have enough registers to, for that matter. Um, turns out Spark and Itanium have registered windows, so it doesn't matter there as well. It was only PowerPC and ARM chips were both common enough, had lots of registers, and no windows that you might care about Call save registers, but the ability to track what was an OOP and what was not was so hard it wasn't worth it. So you ask the question at a safe point, I have a Call save register, is it an OOP or not? Well, I don't know. Only the caller knows. So I have to go up to the call and recursively ask that question up the food chain, and it actually it has a multi-branching exponential effect in the worst case. It's just a pain in the butt. Um, this one I'm going to run out of time for. I do adapter frames. I won't do frame adapters. Don't leave a frame on the stack under any circumstance unless it's an architected frame, language architected frame, because the, 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 the ends of the extra frame screws up all kinds of stack call games. It made such a pain in the butt to, to, to track all kinds of weird bugs, including occasional unbounded frames. Um, but that means that you, you have to agree on return value for all kinds of stack frames, including <laughs> interpreted and jitted code and native code. But it turns out that's generally not a problem. You just pick that, whatever the native code is, once it has a return register, that's it, and everyone agrees. Um, original hotspot would put constant uh, object oriented pointers in the code. You get constants all the time, constant loops happen all the time. Okay, it looks good in 32 bit land, but on 64 bit land, you can't do a 64 bit instruction load. Uh, of a 64 bit pointer load on x86 or any other hardware architecture. And that means that if you do a GC on this pointer and move it, you had to do a multi instruction patch, which wasn't going to happen unless you had a safe point or some running thread got half of it. And that meant you weren't doing an incremental collector, right? So if you want an incremental collector, you can't do it. So don't put them in a table, right? Load them from a table every time. So the guy says, load my table base, which is not moving, it's some constant offset. You know, grab the nth guy in one instruction on an x86 and do a 64-bit load. Now I can do concurrent GC. It's a handful of few instructions. It's actually, you know, it's, 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 uh, I can totally schedule it. Um, easy to scroll down to. I can totally schedule it um, because it's a, you know, one instruction load op with so much delay on the load. But it turns out if it's hot, it's going to be hot in my L1 cache. It's all fast and cheap and whatever. Just a hell lot easier. Um, I took the locked object header out of the stack and hotspot thing, put them in the stack so that you have instances of the locked header in the stack, one for every level of recursion of the lock, and that was how they were avoiding having a recursion count in the header. Not worth it. Don't bother. It makes a horrible <laughs> issue with when you want to do a hash code or an inflating lock into contention or moving things around to a GC. Um, don't bother. Keep your, your lock counters somewhere. 
And so what I had on Azul side was to say, uh, if your uh, uh, the counter went like 0, 1, 2, mini, and at mini I gave you a, a, an off structure of add-on for this object that was tied to this thread. It was only the locking thread that cared. So the thread in question had a list of locked objects that he was dealing with by hand that had every kind of you know, recursion count he needed, plus the fair locking bits he needed to track thousands of people. Like, who's the next guy in the fair lock queue and all that kind of crap? Done. Thank <laughs> you.